everyone and welcome to tonight's Thinking. I'm a reporter, my name's Lara Spirit and tonight we're going to be discussing foreign aid is 0.7% virtue signalling or value for money. Um, thanks for coming to the newsroom and thanks to all those watching at home. Um, I'm joined tonight by two fantastic guests. Uh, Romilly Greenhill is UK director of The One Campaign and Saul Parker is founder of The Good Side. Um, and I think that most people in this room probably, I mean, actually, it'd be quite good. Can we do a poll to start before we've had this discussion of who on instinct would say that they think 0.7% is virtue signaling? So actually, would you say about half? I would say about half of the people in the room think it, 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 is, it is virtue signaling. I probably would have guessed beforehand that I would have thought most people would have said that, that it wasn't virtue signaling. I think one of the reasons for that might be that the 0.7 to 0.5% aid cut that we saw last year was such a deeply politicised decision um, and did get quite a lot of bad press that I would have thought that perhaps many of us would have kind of lumped it in around that whole politics of the time. But I mean, I'm very interested in that and interested to um, discuss that. And I think there are a couple of things that are sort of on my to-do list for tonight in answering this question. One of them is what the impact of the cut has been so far, whether we can assess that, um, whether or not it has had a, a big impact, what the politics of that was, the politics of that summer where this became a really politicised issue, not just between Labour and Conservatives, but actually within the Conservative Party uh, and became one of the, the first and most significant splits that we saw within that party and a pretty sizeable and senior rebellion of Conservative MPs around that time, what the impact of that cut will mean for Ukraine and actually what the Ukraine crisis has done to our conceptions around aid and what it will actually do to the way that we spend aid as a UK government. And I've spoken just to Romney a bit about this, but I hadn't quite grasped just how significant the impacts of that would be. Um, and then finally, can we improve it? Can we improve the way that we think about aid and can we uh, improve the way that we distribute uh, foreign aid? So, Romney, I'm keen to come first to you, if I may, um, at the One campaign to ask just a bit about what the impact so far has been on the of the aid cut as part of thinking about whether or not it is virtue signaling has that has that had an impact and actually before i researched this i must admit i i thought i would fall quite firmly down on the fact that it was virtue it wasn't virtually signaling the 0.7 cut and then i actually read that we were actually performing comparatively quite well before this cut right so aside germany there was no other country that was giving more than us in both absolute and proportional terms. No, no other G7. So no other G7. yes, we were, uh, along with Germany, one of the most generous in the G7. We are, incidentally, the only country uh, across the G7 to have cut aid in the pandemic. So you know, where, when the Chancellor was uh, justifying the decision to cut aid, he said, "Oh, we can't afford it because of COVID, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But if we look across other major economies, we were actually the only one uh, to make those cuts across our, our partners. So yes, we were very good. We're now not really uh, very good at all. Uh, we've got countries like Germany. Germany made a very big uh, pledge recently on supporting the, the global COVID uh, rollout. France is also increasing aid significantly. So I think the UK, we've often sort of thought of ourselves as one of the most generous, but if we look at the facts now, we're, we're definitely, we're sliding down the league table. And the impacts have been really severe, honestly, really, really severe. If you look at something like education, we've now got four million children out of school as a result of these cuts. Um, things like programmes uh, uh, to fight violence against women and girls, cuts of sort of 70%, uh, sexual and reproductive health programmes we've seen cut by three quarters. We've seen huge cuts across Africa. So I think it's this aid cut, it sort of looks like, oh, 0.7 to 0.5, it looks like a small amount of money. Mm. But when you actually see the impacts on the ground, particularly in Africa, and particularly for women and girls and, and children as a whole, it's been really severe. And I think we need to, to really kind of take that seriously. And how has it impacted one's work specifically? Well, we're not UK aid funded. So we are actually mercifully uh, uh, not impacted uh, directly by this. Many of our other partner NGOs, um, you know, Save Children, Oxfam, uh, Care and others are very severely impacted. But for us as one, you know, it, it's not a funding source that we have to worry about. And actually that gives us a bit of freedom to kind of speak speak out and speak truth to power, um, I, I would say, which I think is really helpful. Do you think it's been difficult for organisations who are UK aid funding to speak out without seeming like the argument is, well, of course you would say that because... 
you're funded by us. Possibly, but they're also the organisations that can talk about the impacts on the ground. So if you think about, you know, humanitarian aid, um, if you think about countries like Yemen and Syria, these are countries that saw very big cuts. Uh, and actually some of the organisations that worked on the ground in Yemen were able to really raise the alarm. You know, I think it was something like 50% cuts in humanitarian aid to Yemen. And this is, you know, this is women and children in really severe humanitarian situations that we were just walking away from. And so I think actually having that, that kind of on the ground experience and voice that lots of the NGOs could, could offer, I think that was really helpful. And Saul, I was going to ask you, because you're from the good side, but you're, you've done a lot of work and research into how people perceive aid. And when we were just talking, you mentioned that we don't perhaps talk about the successes well enough. So people like Romney just mentioned, we maybe don't know what UK aid actually even does. So could you say maybe just a bit about why is it that it's absolutely necessary in your opinion? So, yeah, so on, the, on, the, on your point about um, progress, I guess we've been tracking attitudes to aid, working with Romilly and, and various other INGOs over the past four or five years and, 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 and talking to various members, sections of the public about, um, about aid and, and perceptions of the sector. And one of the biggest issues is that people don't feel like they, they, they don't feel like they see progress. They don't feel like they're being told what's happening and that actually people feel like the narrative has been, uh, been unchanging for the past 20, 30 years. And as a result, it's hard for people to understand what the impact looks like or really where their money's kind of going. And so has support for foreign aid, and specifically 0.7, has that fallen over time in the research that you've... When did, you, when did this start, the research? Like, what's the time frame on what you have information there's on? A, there's a, a, a longitudinal tracker that's um, um, published by some academics that's been going for maybe 20 years, looking at attitudes across the global north. Um, and actually, if you look at the, the attitudes across... Other countries have been very stable, but actually in the UK over the past 10 years, there's been a, I mean, they're pretty much halved in terms of public support wow. for um, central government funding. But also, if you look at public, donations have also gone through the floor. In so terms donations of that they make as individuals themselves to these organisations? A number of organisations. And why do you think that might be? I think it, a lot of it is, is nested around the same issue around progress. And, and partly it's about people not feeling like they hear or see progress from the sector, but also there's a a larger kind of issue when you start to look, um, certainly among um, sort of less progressive, more traditional um, audiences, around a kind of de declining faith in multilateral institutions and kind of international projects in general, that actually there's a kind of a sense that, 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 that lots of um, people's sort of hope for change and for um, kind of problem solving en masse has, has just kind of been um, gently eroded over the years. Mm. And Romney, what do you say to those who think that these organisations are kind of too cumbersome, they're inefficient, the aid would be better, as we spoke about Angus Deacon earlier, just as sort of cash transfers or the way that we do it currently with these yeah. organisations, just it's not efficient, it's not value for money. Well, let me give you a couple of examples. So there's a, an organisation called the Global Fund uh, to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. It was set up about 20 uh, years or so ago. The UK um, played a key role in setting up the Global Fund, also been a major donor over the years. That organisation has saved 44 million lives. Wow. I didn't make that up. That's, you know, very well researched, 44 wow. million lives. And if you look at the number of people dying from those three diseases, AIDS, TB and malaria, it's gone down by about half since that organization was set up so not you know there's still people dying and we still need to do more but it's gone down by about half so you know if you say nothing is ever achieved there's 44 million lives mm. and there are actually tools that you can go online you can look at your constituency where you live and you can put your postcode in and you can work out how many lives wow. your contribution for the amount of tax that has been paid from your constituency uh, you know, how many lives have been saved. And not, just to take another example, there's an organisation called Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Yeah. So even before COVID, vaccine, all the childhood vaccinations, the things that we get here as a matter of course when we're, when we're kids, uh, rolling that out around the world, um, 13 million lives uh, saved from that because actually children are, are getting vaccinated, they're not getting mm. sick. You know, and a lot of those are, are, are kids' lives. So I think for people who say nothing ever changes, well, you know, actually the facts don't bear that out. I do agree with Saul. I think we as a kind of NGO community, we need to do a better job at telling these stories. We often like to sort of complain and say things are wrong and kind of, you know, always ask for more. But I think the kind of the stories around what's actually been achieved are really powerful. Um, and I think we need to, to tell them a bit more clearly. And what's heartbreaking now is that the kind of inverse of those stories is that, you know, a lot of those lives won't now be saved because we're not putting the money in as the UK. So, you know, th there's a real risk to that progress going forward. And what forward. is it about the UK, do you think, that makes us an outlier in the G7 and the kind of OECD world? 
So I think there's been a short-term approach here, a short-term approach to thinking. If you think about the kind of the big challenges of the world um, at the moment, you know, it's COVID, it's conflict, and it's climate, let's say. You know, I mean, there's many other challenges, but those are, those are probably three that are at the top of the list. Across all of those areas, you really need to invest now in order to benefit later. You know, on COVID, you need to roll out vaccines and roll out treatments so we don't get more you know, mutations and variants that come back. Climate, you need to invest. We all know this, you know, to reduce carbon emissions. Conflict, you need to invest in peace building. So you need to take a long-term approach. And I think the challenge we have in the UK is that we're taking this very short-term approach. Mm. There's this been sort of slightly bean countery exercise of uh, the economy is not doing so well. We need to cut some aid, cut, you know, cut some spending. Where can we cut? OK, oh, aid, that's fine. So we're not taking that long term approach of how do we invest uh, for the future. And I think, you know, Germany is, is doing that. Germany mm -hmm. is increasing their, their aid budget. They're also increasing their defence budget for reasons we can all understand. But they're making those long term investments. And I think we're just not doing that in this and country. And what's your take on what Sol was saying about the balance between people and politicians in terms of who's culpable, say, in leading us to this path of like decreasing our aid, essentially? Well, it is. It's a political decision. You know, this okay. is very much a political decision. I think the, you know, the narrative in, in 2020 when the aid budget was cut is, oh, you know, we've got this pandemic, we can't afford it. But it was, it's, it was basically 1% of the deficit in 2020 was being spent on aid. So, you know, the amount we saved was, was 1%. It's something like 0.2% of overall government spending. So, I mean, you know, this is not big. It's not large amounts of money. That money could be spent elsewhere. So I think it's very much a kind of political decision. Um, and we as campaigners and NGOs are really trying to hold politicians to account and say, you made that decision, actually, you can, you can reverse it. And the political decision to fold the FCDO with DFID, what's yeah. been the, the kind of day-to-day -day impact on that? And what impact do you think it had leading us to the 0.7 decision? So I think it had a really severe impact. Um, You've, it's been very noticeable that there is no longer, well, there's no longer anyone at the cabinet table uh, who has a development brief. There's actually no minister. There's no one minister who is formally in charge of development. So in other countries, even when you have, you might have your development department merge with your foreign office, you generally have some sort of minister. You have somebody right. with that kind of role. We don't have that in the UK. All mm -hmm. of our ministers are divided portfolios. And so you have nobody able to stand up and make that long-term case and nobody able to say we should be investing in health and conflict prevention and mm. climate because that's what's needed for the future mm. and so because you've got nobody at the cabinet table saying that you've seen the budget cuts you've seen you know all the other problems and deprioritization mm. and of I'm, in, I'm interested especially in this idea that quite often the public being quite forgiving or at least it's been more obvious like you've said the impact that health aid has had compared to other forms of aid but at Tortoise we've done quite a lot of work on vaccines as mm -hmm. you have obviously on COVID vaccines and were kind of just shocked and slightly horrified by the story a couple of weeks ago I think it was three weeks ago into the UK counting its vaccine donations as part of its age budget which yeah. could effectively save it 140 yeah. million pounds and I'm wondering what the accountability mechanism for that is and actually when we've been doing it, I've also been wondering and I know you've done work on this like do the public care and is this going to be a source of outrage in the way that has for us. And I think I've had quite a sobering conclusion that maybe they would think that it's that I'm being virtuous again, for example, by thinking this. And yeah, yeah. I've had a real kind of reckoning yeah, with it because yeah. of that, I think. Yeah. So I think the public care about, well, the public care about three things. One is we know that actually the public really care about global vaccine access. So, you know, we've done a, a load of polling on this. Uh, I don't know if the good side also have, but we, you know, well, we've done sort of waves of polling um, and we know that the public really support that. So that's kind of really encouraging for us to see that the public are, are on board with that message. The point on how we score it as ODA, the Prime Minister stood up in Parliament last year and said twice that the value of donated COVID vaccines would be additional to the existing aid budget. He said that very clearly. He was asked that by two MPs and he was very clear that it would be additional to, to, so to the aid budget. I'm, well, I'm not going to say he lied, <laughs> but, but, you know, because I'm on record here, I'm on Zoom. <laughs> um, but, you know, they have, they have not um, followed through on that commitment. Um, 
And I think um, that's really problematic because essentially what it means is when we are, you know, we had excess uh, COVID vaccines that we've been sharing with other countries quite rightly, we are then cutting the aid budget elsewhere to fund that. You mm. know, so we bought more than we need, we're sharing them, mm. and therefore we're going to cut education in Somalia yeah. or, or Ethiopia or, or you know, we're Sierra Leone. For, for, for yeah, and, and actually, because of this, the, the story you referred to, that we're overcharging, you know, we're going to cut the education budget in Sierra Leone by more than we actually spent on the vaccine doses. So I do think there is public concern on us kind of... You know these sort of stealth raids on the aid budget. Mm. We can put it. Put that's it that a really way. good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Brains, yeah. I think. And, yeah. And I think that's what I mean is I'm just interested in the political ecosystem in which that's even vaguely permissible, right? I find it astonishing. And Andrew, um, Adam Bailey in the chat saying, "Good news impacts stories don't get the focus they deserve," which is, I think what saw you were mentioning. If you were going to poll, if you were going to ask people, do you think is it virtue signalling? What do you think the majority of people would say? I think people find the notion of 0.7% impossible to get their heads around. And I think part of the reason why the cut was so easy to pass was because, you know, when it comes to the, the public you know, understanding either small numbers or really huge numbers, when really, I guess this is a small number that actually reflects a really big number, it's just so hard for people to get their heads around. And I think people find the whole space so difficult. But at the same time, you know, we know that if you look at public support for the, for, for the sector and for, you know, aid in, in general from a sort of philosophical, political standpoint, you know, it's pretty wavering. It feels like such a safe bet and I think um, you know after 10 years of, of a government that's been hammering us with messages around austerity and the need to cut wherever possible it just seems like such an easy win mm, that so the austerity you think has had an impact on the way that public Without a doubt, if you speak to people about it today, you know they'll 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 talk about problems at home. They'll talk about the climate. They'll talk about you know anything but um, problems in the global south. And how helpful do you think it is the framing of um, foreign aid around goals of national interest? So I think we had this discussion around vaccine inequality, where for a long time a number of tortoises will be absolutely sick of us saying it. <laughs> but we had we said it's you know it's not just in everybody else's interest; it's in our interest too, and it's enlightened self-interest, so to speak. And I wonder if as a message as a message, you think that just doesn't cut through. And we talk about foreign aid. Do you think that people understand that foreign aid in many ways is part of an aid that works in our own interests and it's used as, as such? I think people, when it comes to, um, to health, um, I think people understand the notion, notions of global security and health security being part of that. So I think you do see, I mean, it's, the, it's the number one kind of issue that most people feel pretty kind of amoral about and quite apolitical about. So I think it there's certainly that na that narrative does kind of cut through, and I think just sort of n notions of kind of of sort of saving lives and uh, human longevity are, are kind of you know timelessly significant to people. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that does kind of make sense, and I, I, I can you can see why the the notion of of, of shifting money towards vaccine initiatives it doesn't for, for many people doesn't really feel that problematic. Mm -hmm. And James, just James S B is making a very good point in the chat about the difference between charity and aid, and if we can bring him in in a second, that would be fantastic. But do you want to? What was on your mind? I, I was going to say in terms of this national interest uh, arguments, because it's one of the things that we as sort of NGOs often struggle with. And 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 two observations. One is, as you were saying, I think the sort of mutual interest, like. Uh, um, as I understand it, the public do support that idea of, you know, investing in health, which is in all of our benefit, investing in tackling climate change, in all of our benefit, conflict reduction and so on. So I think the idea of, like, it should be purely in the UK interest doesn't get a lot of support, but that whole sort of creating a better world for all of us, mm -hmm. that's my understanding that that tends to do better. What we find, actually, is with political audiences, the national interest arguments actually land much better. So if What can, makes a political audience? Well, I'm thinking about sort of MPs and those around right, MPs. Okay. So I can talk to an MP and say, you know, this is going to be good for the British economy right, or this is going to be good for sort of peace and security in the UK. We find that, you know, that those mm. arguments tend to resonate more with political leaders maybe than they do with the, the public, which is quite um, interesting. Were you surprised to see such a senior large rebellion on this decision over the summer around cutting the aid budget? Not particularly. And I think that the, the point you made about the seniority of the rebellion was, was is very well made. I mean, unfortunately, when it comes to MP votes, you know, your Theresa May or your new backbencher, it doesn't really make a difference. There's still one vote, <laughs> unfortunately, sadly. Unfortunately, maybe, fortunately. Yeah, so, well, I don't, you know. Um, but, but actually, if you looked at the people who were, who were standing up against the aid cuts, it was an enormously senior mm. crowd. It was chairs of the main It was chairs. It was chairs of the select committee. Yeah. It, was, it was former cabinet ministers. It was sort of former leadership candidates. 
and, and my analysis of former prime ministers, by the way, mm -hmm. most of whom are no longer in, in parliament, but a lot of them was, you know, speaking out against the cut. And I think it's actually because that experience that those uh, MPs had, their experience of going around the world and traveling and understanding the impact of UK aid, you know, that made them feel mm. quite passionately a mm. about it. Whereas I think maybe some of the, you know, newer MPs that just hadn't engaged very much in this topic, hadn't traveled, hadn't necessarily had that kind of senior level experience. Yeah. You know, they, they just, they hadn't seen it and partly also because of pandemic and so on. Um, so I think it was quite interesting just to kind yeah. of observe the dynamics in that, in yeah. that group. And I think James is actually making a, a related point if he is there, we can bring him in. But I should also say anyone in the audience here, if you want to, Kerry, hi, I didn't see you. <laughs> What's on your mind, Kerry? Well, I think, so I'm Kerry, I, I work at Tortoise. I, I, I know that Saul wasn't making a point about causality between 0.7% and declining public support. But I, but I do think we, we do need to at least consider the, the possibility that the two things are linked and that there has been an unintended consequence of this. Because in the end, you, you do have to pay attention to the level of public support. In the end, you know, I can, I can see this fascinating dilemma for NGOs and one campaign and whoever that as, as the 0.7% stays steady and public support declines, the jeopardy grows year after year after year. And at some point, you've either got to decide to open up that debate, even at the risk of, of, of putting the 0.7% into question, or for me, in the end, you end up in a place where the thing is going to crash because because pub politicians will pay attention to that to that gap in in the long run. The, I mean, we're talking about the we're talking about the decision to go to 0.5% as political. The decision to go to 0.7% is political as well. It, this is all this is all political. And and the, I'm not as impressed by the seniority of the people who were on your side of the argument in the Conservative Party because they represent. They represent a piece of the Tory party that is that is not represented in the red wall seats. That is not, you know, that, that's the, you know, those are your sort of great and the good from Surrey and the home counties, and who have a, an idea of the Conservative Party would appreciate the signal that this did send about the kind of Conservative Party they wanted, which is not the kind of Conservative Party that a lot of the younger MPs would want. But I suppose, you know, I suppose the. I think we, in this room, we just need to think our way through whether actually we have accidentally jeopardized public support by imposing this thing. In the end, I think it's probably lucky that we say 0.7%, not the actual sum, because I suspect if you said the number out loud, people would be even more horrified than they are by a figure they can't quite understand. What do you think? Do you agree? So I think you raise a really interesting uh, question. It's something that we have discussed, as you as you hinted at, as a sort of NGO. And I think one of the challenges is really about, you know, how do you communicate these progress messages that I was just talking about, the Global Fund and the, the Vaccine Alliance? Because if I ring up the newspaper and say, hey, I've got a great story, you know, 44 million lives saved, everything's lovely, we're making loads of progress, they'd be like, oh, boring. You know, whereas <laughs> if, you find, if somebody phones them up and says, oh, scandal, you know, something's gone wrong, some project, money's been wasted, blah, 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 you're much more likely to get media coverage. So it is something, to be honest, that for a number of years we were quite conscious of, and we, we kn knew that we needed to get better at telling those progress stories. But, and, and, you know, I think this is, this is something that we struggled and maybe it'd be interesting as, you know, Tortoise is a media organisation, like, how do you think about, how do you tell those stories and engage people? Mm. Um, because inevitably then the things that go wrong get more coverage and the things that go right don't get coverage. And I think therefore people, the only time they're reading about aid is when there's some sort of scandal. It was quite interesting last year, this, um, the, the survey that Saul was talking about, what we saw is a huge increase in support for aid. And I asked the, the, the people who run it, I said, oh, well, is, is that just because people are happier with the, with the lower levels of aid? And they said their analysis was that because aid had been so much in the media and we had been talking about, oh, you know, women's access to contraception programs that had been cut, girls' education programs that had been cut, you know, uh, violence against women and girls' programs that had been cut. People had been sort of saying, oh, we didn't realize all this good stuff was going on. Now we know it's being cut, we actually, you know, we're actually realizing what we're missing in a way. So, so I think you're 100% right. And I'm, you know, it is something that we need to get better at as, a, as an NGO community. Mm. If I can jump in again. Yeah, just, of course you can. Do you think it's possible that 
the 0.7% has helped to, to drive down public support? Yeah, quite possibly. Quite possibly. The fact that it's been there um, and the fact that it's been sort of a ring-fenced budget, um, it, it's, yes, and I, and I think the fact that it's a sort of input target uh, as well, so it's sort of focused on what we're spending, not what it's delivering, um, I think it has uh, arguably. And those, those proposals for improving the way that we do the target, what did you think of those, this idea that maybe we have the target stretched out over a couple of years, or maybe we, we have a little kind of buffer zone where you can go a little bit under, a little bit over? Because yeah. I think some people have this idea of civil servants previously sat yeah. in DFID getting yeah. towards the end of the deadline being yeah. like, I want to chuck 10 million pounds yeah. on that yeah. because I need to reach, yeah. reach, yeah. reach the and, and I know, of course, in some sense, that's farcical and not true, but I think that's definitely a perception, surely, among some. I, I think that's true. And I mean, personally, this may not be an organisational position. I, I would be quite happy with a sort of three-year rolling average or right. something like that, because I think you would actually get rid of a lot of those concerns. In reality, I think what happened in terms of meeting the target was that the they would use contributions to these big multilaterals. So actually people like the Global Fund that I was mentioning and Gavi that can absorb money and spend it well, you know, if you were sitting in DFID and you were a bit below 0.7, you would actually put money into those, those organisations who would then spend it over a longer period of time. So, you know, I never saw evidence of, oh, quickly spend the money now on some rubbish project just to meet the target. But I think the perception is there. So I think the idea of having it as a sort of three year or based on the last year's national income or, you know, there's ways that you could adjust the way the target was was met, mm. which wouldn't have a huge impact, but I think would allay quite a lot of those fears, mm. to be honest. And so do you think the 0.7 target had an impact on public support? Because I'm, I'm interested specifically in what Kerry says about the idea that the, the relationship between responsiveness and public opinion and this idea that actually maybe people might not have been in favour of 0.7 but did conservative politicians activate quite a sort of latent position which obviously we know from Brexit as being this massive massive very toxic debate but I wonder if you think there's something to that when we come to the 0.7 yeah I question. think just building on what Romney said I think um, in terms of the spike we saw in, in, in awareness and engagement over the past couple of years um, I think if, if you, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking to people who are what we call marginally engaged with the, the sector so we're, who are kind of aware of, of, of obviously development issues but, but are not kind of super kind of connected and then what you find with that audience is a massive part of the UK population is they just don't think about aid very often. They just don't think about this stuff. And when you ask them to think about it and ask them questions about it, they start to read about it. And often they actually become much more engaged and much more positive. Just purely by having to, having to think about it. So, you know, when you pay someone to think about something, ask them questions about it over a zero period of time, we, we see people transform their own opinions without us kind of pushing them in any direction, which I think is just really interesting in terms of that, the yeah. sense of kind of disengagement. Well, generally, it's, it's complicated. It's kind of over there. It's people who aren't really like me, and, and people find it very easy to kind of other the whole problem. So I think that's sort of part of it. The other thing is that, that I think makes this super knotty as an issue is that if you look at... Um, the political allegiances of people who are less engaged, they don't actually fall along political lines. So it's an okay. issue that, it's a hot topic, you know, like many of this kind of, the, of the current, current paradigm that don't really fall along kind of neat um, sort of left and right political lines, which, which makes it kind of hard to see um, how you kind of track it in terms, yeah. of, in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of political support. And my colleague Max is in the room. I'm quite interested to hear from you because you've had direct experience of working with UK and what the impact of the cut has actually been kind of on the ground. I, mean, I, I know that we've had quite a sort of theoretical in some sense discussion, but if you could talk a bit to your experiences, be quite grateful. Yeah, uh, thanks, Lara. Um, so I worked for a number of organisations over the last kind of seven years uh, that delivered under the Conflict, Stability and Stabilisation Fund, which was cross-departmental at the time, still is, um, and really saw quite drastic cuts, I mean, 70% across some of the projects that I'd either was sitting kind of adjacent to, um, particularly, I think, across Africa and topics in Africa. At the time, I was managing a project that was focusing in Eastern Europe, and you know, this was a year, two years ago, and we actually saw increases. And I think that's because it was looking much more at security issues, um, topics that you would kind of typically see in the press, versus um, a lot of the kind of other projects that I'd worked on in the past, or people that I'd worked with in the past who were saying that they're just seeing their budgets really heavily slashed um, so I think it has a very very big impact quite quickly uh, but also you don't see the disruption that that has on delivery in the moment because your whole project is slightly on hold you know you, you can't get sign off to do certain activities you need to make sure that you're you have to review your theory of change and everything so I think that not only is there an impact in 
the follow-on, but there's also right in that moment the uncertainty that that can create. Um, but I, I would also completely agree with the panel that this is about communication. And I think when you look at the stories, I mean, the three that I can remember in the press, one in the Daily Mail, one in the FT about um, schools collapsing in Pakistan because of some of the funding, which was quite big at the time. It was in like 2019. Um, and then there was a panorama program about how apparently some companies had given funding to ISIS supporters in Syria or something like that. The money that was at risk was like 125 pounds. But it was an, a, a half an hour panorama episode talking about how aid um, was having this impact and how we were funding you know, jihadist groups in, in the Middle East, which is just, it's just not true. Mm. Um, but the conversation is so looking to bash what the aid budget is doing and not really looking at have a conversation that is how can you work in a context like Syria and help people without having some element of risk and accepting that. I, one final thing I would say is I also work for an American company who were coming to the UK to set up and look to work much more in uh, UK development and explaining the concept of value to money to Americans who had been, who, you know, there, um, there are a billion dollars in aid from the US government. Having to explain value to money to them was like, it was a really big conversation. Mm. They just don't have that consideration. And maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it goes a lot to show the kind of, when they're talking about how do we have an effective budget, how do we deliver well, it was about how do we, um, it wasn't about how do we make sure the nickels and dimes count it was what's going to be the most effective thing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a huge That's cultural really point, and I think there's a huge point about how we communicate about aid that we, we're not doing as effectively as we could. Mm. And really, this might be a silly question, but how does the UK government evaluate the effectiveness of its foreign aid? So there's huge amounts of evaluation and scrutiny that goes on, and I think your point is very well made that, mm. you know, the, the kind of the, the few examples where things go wrong, and, and things do go wrong, you know, if you're spending, it, you know, across a number of very complex environments, you know, things will go wrong. Uh, and actually, the, the, probably the worst thing you can do is never take any risk and never go anywhere, you know, in, in a sort of fragile environment. Because in a sense, if you're doing things that are too easy, then there's a bit of a question about whether you're focusing on the right area. But there is an enormous amount of scrutiny uh, of the aid budget. Um, and particularly, there's something called the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, um, which actually was set up under the Conservative government in the early 2010s um, to be a kind of arm's length scrutiny body. Um, so it sort of uh, it reports into Parliament, uh, has quite a strong relationship with FCDO, but it's not part of the structure. Um, so that is very uh, mm. impactful in terms of actually doing really in-depth analysis of how UK aid is spent. There's obviously the normal, the kind of the NAO, the Public yeah. Accounts Committee, all of those kind of... Uh, so it's it, very monitored. It's extremely... It's, it's one of the most monitored part of, parts of government, actually. So this idea that, you know, all this money sort of goes down into a black hole is, is simply not true. There's also kind of international standards and mechanisms for sort of, you know, ascertaining what is aid, what isn't aid mm -hmm. through the sort of OECD and so on. So, and have they changed yeah. over the years? Is it the case that we used to maybe think more in terms of lives saved and now we might think more in terms of security or kind of, you know, geopolitical interests that different countries have? Because I remember reading that the MOD and then the Conservative Manifesto in 2017, there'd been this push of we want to integrate more this idea of security into the way that we think about aid. Yeah, I mean, I think so that's less on the evaluation point, but generally when we're thinking about aid, yes, we are seeing a kind of much closer alignment between uh, sort of aid uh, uh, and thinking about development and then thinking about sort of foreign policy and security issues. Um, particularly since DFID was merged into the into right, the Foreign okay. Office. So if we're looking at which countries uh, money is going to, as, as you were saying, you know, Africa has actually received a disproportionate cut. It's not just, you know, the A budget has been cut across the board. We're seeing much less going into Africa and we're seeing more going into the Indo-Pacific region because that's in line with our kind of broad set of foreign policy priorities. So, yes, that's definitely a trend that we're seeing. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm keen to do our slowdown, which is a two-minute break which means that if it's possible for you to turn to the person next to you and have a go at answering this question, especially in light of what we've just spoken about, that'd be great. And then when we come back, I'm keen to talk about Ukraine and, and what it means now for our relationship with aid.
Okay, we're back. Um, I think that we should be able to see the result of our poll. 86% says it's value. it's value for money. Interesting. And have the views in the room changed by much at all? Can you put your hands up if you think it is value for money? So it is value for money. Interesting. I would say that's a large majority in support of value for money. Um, yeah, Emma? Please do. Yeah, can someone give Emma a mic? Is that okay? Thanks. That a value for money statement is kind of wrong in its own sense because what's value for money? Value for money is in the outcomes you're talking about. So whether you've got 0.6% or 0.9%, it is irrelevant about whether it's value for money. Yeah. So that statement for me is like, well, it's got to be about signaling because it doesn't really matter what that number is. Value for money is what are you delivering for that number, whatever that number is. So it is in, like you were saying, the life saved or the and, you know, the, the children that have been schooled when they wouldn't have been and all of that. So I'm really interested that people say 0.7 is value for money because fundamentally for me, I think that's not really a question in that That's sense. a really, yeah, that's a really, Max. And then Kat. Come on, um, broadly as a statement and then a question, um, if I might. You can. Because uh, it's thinking about the research that you guys have been doing, and particularly with May Day, which was an organization that supported the Syrian White Helmets, um, which was funded by the international community across, um, from loads of different donors, including the UK. And to your point on the kind of evaluation of that funding, there was a huge investigation done on May Day because of a Russian disinformation attack. But in general, no money was misplaced. And the invest they went through such a detailed audit down to every single pound, and they found that no money was misplaced at any point which I think is incredible when you consider that they're providing assistance to the White Helmets in terms of equipment, salaries, et cetera, that none of this went into any of the wrong pockets. And that's not really spoken about. But my question was going to be around the campaign was, have you, did you ever see that, do people connect that actually that significant amount of funding went from the UK budget to help May Day and White Helmets? And did people make that connection that of a group that was really heralded as a good group um, that we were there supporting them and that you know, the UK government was providing funding there. So our research tends to look at people who are sort of less interested or less supportive of I think as, as, as in general they would just not be kind of connecting with an issue as kind of granular as that. I think this is quite, sort of, quite specific and quite technical. But we were just talking about the kind of efficiency value point and we've done quite a lot of work asking people how much, just as an example, how much every pound do you think you know, makes it to end beneficiaries from, you know, from the average INGO? And people kind of massively underestimate. So people 20 pence, you know, 30 pence, 40 pence of a pound. And actually, you know, they've got Romney will not know the realities, but it's you know it's a, it's a kind of it's a flip really in terms of you know how much money gets to a beneficiary. And but what we always talk about is you know, if you were to make if you were to make an analogy with a commercial entity and think about that in terms of profit versus operating costs, charities would be the, like the most profitable company on the planet, and they would be you know sort of hugely kind of high value. But people don't really can't, can't really make that connection. Mm. It's interesting. Adam in the chat is saying that. Um, as an international target which was set up back in the 70s, it's not virtue signalling. When very few countries have hit it and it becomes politicised, it can go in that direction. But he's interested to know if the UK has done enough to push other countries to 0.7%. I don't think we've spoken too much about this, but sometimes the justification for us having 0.7% to your point, Emma, is this idea that we'll be a kind of city on a hill to speak, you know, like Reagan. It's kind of, we're going to set an example for other people to follow. And even if it is semi-symbolic, it at least does have, does have merit in that sense. I mean, it, it is the case that the UK used to be a massive international development leader. Um, it was very well respected for its kind of international uh, development uh, efforts. If you take a, an example, so um, in 2000, no, 2015, there was this process of developing a new set of sort of global goals, the sustainable development goals, uh, and sort of international community had to come together under the auspices of the UN to agree what those goals were. David Cameron was one of the three chairs of that process uh, mm. because of the British leadership. You know, under the Labour government, there was a huge amount of leadership at Glen Eagles, at the G G8 and so on. But my point on Cameron is that this, this hasn't been a party political thing across Labour and uh, Conservatives and Lib Dems to the extent, you know, when they're in coalition. Um, you know, it's been something that we have really led internationally. And I think it's something that is not very well understood in this country, that we kind of have a huge amount of kudos from our, from mm. our international efforts. I remember sitting a few years ago in, in New York with a lot of UN negotiators 
And a lot of the UN negotiators from the South, from, you know, from India, from across Africa, they were absolutely livid with the North for not meeting its promises, as, as, um, as, a, as the, the person said. You know, the, the aid target, the 0.7 target, has been in existence since 1970. And a lot of these developing countries were saying, look, we've had this target for 50 mm. years, and you, you know, where are you guys? Why haven't you met it? But they, you know, they turned to the UK representative and said, but you guys are okay, you mm. know, you've met it. You know, we like you, you meet your promises, you keep, you stick to your commitments, you're putting your money where your mouth is. And actually, I think there's been a real kind of sense of trust in Britain around the world. And I think, to go back to this public communication point, I don't think people in this country know that necessarily. They, you know, I don't think we've told that story, that this is something that really kind of gives us that kind of reputation. And I think, again, it's a sort of challenge for communicators to think about how do we tell that mm. story a bit better. And it's interesting that we met it for the first time in 2015, I think, and then obviously left the European Union. 2013. Like, yeah. 2013. 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And yeah. Kat, I think you had a point. Um, yeah, sorry, it's like side sidetrack. Um, but I just asked in the chat about whether we all at, like know where our UK aid funding goes. Um, and then Sean shared a really helpful, um, like the development tracker, where you can break down aid funding by department. So I think it's quite often like seen that aid funding by the UK government it comes specifically and solely from FCDO, but it goes like cross departmental. So from previous experience working like immigration in the Home Office, like a percentage of the FCDO aid funding goes towards immigration control and border force. So I think like your point to um, aid and it changing to like a discourse of like security, I just think it's kind of in terms of Emma's point as well about like value for money, it's like what are we actually getting out of the aid funding? Mm. What is it the UK government's trying to do with it? So yeah, we're doing 0.7% and in the global scheme of things that seems like a lot, but I think we need to like pay a lot of a lot closer attention to what projects that's funding. It's a really good point. It's very iffy. Yeah. Um, so we were talking and it actually brings us quite nicely onto this question of Ukraine because I hadn't realized and found out before this that actually quite a lot of the money that we would think would be domestic spending on Ukraine, so give you know homes to refugees, um, is going to come out of the UK foreign aid budget, is that right? That's right. So under the, so there's, there's an internationally agreed set of rules of what counts as aid, and that's quite important because it means that we're all kind of counting, and when we're comparing across countries and so on, we stick to the same rules. What those rules do say is that for the first year that refugees come into this country, whatever we spend on them, whether it's B and B accommodation, homes for Ukraine, schooling, you know, food, etc., that can be counted as aid for the for the first year. That they're in this so country. That could, that could take a huge portion. It, it could potentially be really big. It and has there be, been yeah. any estimation done of what the impact on aid spending outside of Ukraine will be if it is if the budget isn't increased? Well, this is a th one of the things that we are really worried about because if you think, you know, it's obviously right that we're pushing money into Ukraine. It's obviously 100% right we're supporting refugees. But I'm not sure that the public really realise that a lot of that money is coming at the expense of, of, of Africa and, and, and other crises indeed. And those countries, it's not only that they're, you know, the, the, the attention is going from them into Ukraine, they're also being massively impacted because food prices are rising so high. You know, Ukraine and Russia, huge percentage of the world's kind of wheat and grains are, are grown in those countries. So we're seeing massive, we're seeing rising food prices here, we all know that, it's a problem. You know, it's also impacting Africa um, and very severely. So those are countries that are being very hard hit by that crisis and meanwhile are also going to lose a lot of their aid. So actually, if you read your Times newspaper tomorrow, I believe you will see an advert signed onto by a number of NGOs oh, yeah. really saying to the Chancellor, you know, you need to be uh, raising the aid budget now. You know, this is, we're at a time of, of converging crises. You know, it's absolutely right we support Ukraine, but it should not come at the expense of other people around the world. Mm. And that's just, that's just not right. And so in that sense, does that make the 0.7 figure seem, seem slightly totemic, right? Because in reality, in this crisis, it should be far more. For example, I mean, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be delighted if it was one percent. I'm, I'm not. I'm <laughs> living in the real world, but actually, I think 
of the argument that we've made is, look, you made this aid cut at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, we don't agree with it, but you made it for your own reasons. But actually, the world has changed quite significantly since you originally made that decision. You've had your Afghanistan crisis, let's not forget. You've got this massive Ukraine crisis. You've also got the vaccine dose sharing that we, that we talked about. So actually, a lot has happened since you made that decision. And really, whether or not it was right at the time, you know, it, it, you need to go back to point seven now. This is actually the right thing to do at this, at this moment. Mm. And how do you think the Ukraine crisis has changed the way that the public think about aid? Because obviously, there's been a huge amount of support outpouring for Ukraine. Has that, do you think, made us more likely to support greater aid in now and in future years? I think there's the way that people look at humanitarian disasters is completely different to how they look at um, more sort of structural, kind of systemic um, development. And, and, you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing together has been about trying to, you know, help people understand that aid is about, you know, all those things. It's about disasters, it's about moments that, that need support, but it's also about these long-term sustainable projects like education, water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and actually, you know, but you, you see these, you know, th these spikes whenever there's a whenever there's a, a moment, and, and it you know it fits with news cycles and kind of mental salience that actually people kind of I don't think that I don't think we'll see any long term um, change in terms of support based on what's happening right now. Okay, interesting. And Seb, I saw you made a point in the chat. Is it okay to come to you to expand on that a bit because it does speak to the way that we talk about and understand foreign aid? I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think that people kind of my age and younger, so I guess Gen, Gen Z in general, um, perceive foreign aid in like a very specific, or I, I may be generalizing, but I think in, in a lot of conversations I have, it, there is this perception that foreign aid is just this form of kind of white saviorism, you know, it's like, um, and, and for example, there's this, this Instagram account um, called Humanitarians of Tinder, um, and it's where people post on their Tinder account um, a photo of them and you know ambiguous village in Africa holding up children um, and I think and I think that is reflective of the way people you know Gen Z sees foreign aid it's like just us doing this to like kind of feel good about ourselves and to look good on photos and and, and clearly that's not the case um, but you know how, how do we convince people you know this this generation um, my, my generation and, and younger that you know, that there's so much more to it, like, you know, disaster relief, for example, um, you know, ha it's so much more than just holding up some kids and taking a photo to put on your Tinder account kind of thing. Um, Do you find there's a generational aspect in the way in which aid is, like, communicated and received? I think there's probably, I think, yeah, I think there's, there are definitely kind of disparities across generations. I think that's really, it's such an interesting question, you know, and actually if you look at, you know, if you look at where, where funding goes, you know, so much of INGO funding goes to organizations on the ground and pays, you know, frontline workers, you know, from the global south, from communities to, you know, to work in communities. There's been a huge shift, like Romney can talk about this much more cogently than I can, over the past 10, 10, 15 years to really kind of, you know, redress that sense of kind of, you know, white people flying in to solve problems. And actually, you know, that's just not really the way that, that aid, the reality of aid today. But I think there was so much baggage, and we see this, you know, throughout the sector in terms of communications from brand aid and live aid, you know, these huge moments in time, these big kind of moments of collective giving, but actually have been, you know, hugely kind of deleterious, I think, in terms of the perceptions of the sector, because that trope of, you know, um, of privileged white people feeling very smug, kind of flying in, has really persisted. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a really important question, a really important area. You know, actually, within the NGO sector, there's a huge number of conversations going on about this sort of decolonizing aid, and particularly the sort of localization agenda. So, as Saul says, yeah, this idea of sort of, you know, the white person has to come along and the expert from the north and, and so on. I mean, those messages were actually outdated for decades, but I think the kind of perception and the messaging sometimes still looks like that. Um, so, this sort of big focus on how do we kind of localize aid, how do we make sure more of it goes and is under the control of local governments and NGOs and so on. I mean, that's also, by the way, how you spend aid well, because generally, you know, the kind of expert from the north doesn't generally know how to, to do it. I wanted to ask you about this, this yeah, idea yeah, that yeah. In, among critics of foreign aid, they often yeah. say, well, we're in favour of cash transfers. And yeah, actually, yeah. the big problem is that you end up giving money to governments that might be corrupt and you end up yeah. enabling regimes that you don't want to. And is there a more effective way than the way that we currently think about it to get money to those who need it directly? So in Ebola, for example, money went straight to yeah. people who needed it or yeah. after, you know, in Lebanon, for example, we have had that. Is that seen as a more effective way? And do you think it's sustainable if it's rolled out on a kind of larger scale? Yeah, I mean, cash transfers are incredibly effective. There's a huge uh, body of evidence that suggests that cash transfers are a really good way of, of supporting people in poverty and help to kind of get kids in school and, and, and all the rest of it. So I'm all in favour of that. Um, 
often they're most they're very effective when governments actually run them a bit like you know here we have kind of you know various benefits and so on that, that people can receive so it's not necessarily a kind of the antithesis of, of governments, you know, because you in a more stable government, you might have a government running a cash transfer program. But if they're and, a corrupt government, that's difficult. Well, no, right? exactly. So I mean, the, the thing with the thing with corrupt governments is that the the, the kind of the best um, the best way of thinking about aid is if you've got a good government that wants to you know support and can run these programs and is efficient and not corrupt give the money to them, great, let them do it, support them, monitor, you know, be involved, kind of, obviously there has to be accountability, but let them lead the process. If you don't have a corrupt, if you, if you have a corrupt government or if you're in a conflict situation, for example, then actually cash transfers provided by somebody else, like an NGO or the UN or whoever it may be, are often the best uh, way to, to, to go about it. So it's, it, you have to be really kind of variegated according to, to the approach. And there's been various kind of initiatives of like, you know, can you sort of set something up that where the government doesn't control the money, but you know, you can have like the World Bank or the UN controlling Monitor the money, it. but the government's okay. involved. You know, there, there's a whole sort of spectrum of how you can actually spend the, the money well. But I do think, yeah, cash transfer is incredibly uh, uh, beneficial and important and have shown really good good results so I think that's and that is a way of taking you know giving people control giving them choices you support local markets often you give them to women who you know tend to <laughs> on average spend it better than men I'm afraid to say so you know there, there's a lot to be said uh, a lot to be said for, for cash transfers because they're very hard to communicate around they because are, people see yeah. it as a handout, and that's the thing yeah. that people don't yeah. want is uh, a handout. Yeah. So, so the public less supportive. The, the public have yeah. a real problem with it. So it's you know we know from you know from from from, from work across the sector that they are hugely e efficient, and there's loads of data to show how how effective they can be. But it's really difficult to talk about. Interesting. That's that's fascinating to me because it really been one of the first times I'd read about how effective they were was actually today. So it's interesting that they're actually not as popular. But I've just caught the eye of the finishing flag. Um, on that screen, which means unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you both so much uh, for joining us. I feel like I learned a huge deal. And thank you to everyone in the newsroom um, and at home. I'm supposed to make an announcement. There's, there's Thinkins next week, but there's no Thinkins tomorrow. Am I right, Mark? Uh, it's Twitter Spaces. Twitter Spaces tomorrow. Okay, cool. At 6.30. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Have a lovely evening.